Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more from filmmakeru.com or, of course, on Instagram at filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm rejoined by Brendan Ugama, uh, who recently worked on the horror anthology series Them for season two. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd love to know how you got involved with season two of Them. Um, I got involved just, it was, uh, something that my agent brought to me and, um, I knew of the show before I had seen the show season one, when it came out and I loved it just as a, as a fan. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was brilliantly written, shot, performed, directed everything. I, I was such a fan of it. I told my agent at the time, I would love to do a show like this. And, uh, and then when season two came up, um, I got the script and, you know, I, I met with little Marvin, the showrunner creator of the show. And we, we talked for a while and, and kind of hit it off and, you know, the rest, uh, it, then it happened, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'd love to know, cause you know, season one, cause it's an anthology series. So the first season is completely different from the second season. So you worked on the pilot. So I'm wondering, what did you guys discuss? How, how did you guys figure out what the look is going to be for the season? You know, we treated it like a pilot of any show, really. We we did not really reference anything from season one, except for the fact that it was a great show and, and mm -hmm. well made. And the aspect ratio, uh, I guess, is one thing we discussed, 2.4.0, which is what we wanted to do on this anyways. But for finding the look, I mean, it was the same way we do everything. We, 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 uh, have, we read the scripts. We have tons of discussions about it. We go off instinct and we kind of build from there. And I think we had a, a fairly quick prep process on this before we started shooting uh, the first episode, but um, we would sit in little Marvin's office between myself, Craig McNeil, the director and little Marvin, and we would throw ideas out every day. We'd look at images from different films. We'd look at photography. We'd look at things that inspired us and we just, brainstorm on everything to do with the show and the look kind of came from all of that um we knew initially we wanted it to be a version of a gritty 90s los angeles and and that was a major question that we would ask ourselves what that would look like mm -hmm. and so you know getting to that kind of tinged orange yellow color that we have in there is something that that built from there something that little Marvin references as, as part of like his memories from childhood. And it was all these different things that came together to kind of, to come up with that, that, that hue that we had hmm. and the texture and everything just kind of, yeah, it all came from that. I've been a camera person for 30 years and I fell in love with cinema. I heard there was free film school in France and I wanted to get into the French film school. I really didn't know anything at the time, but I knew at least how to take pictures. So I said, I'll try for the image department. And then when I miraculously <laughs> got into the French film school, I fell in love with working with the camera. You're following what's going to be in the movie. So that immediacy that the camera allows is what I loved from the beginning. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and this is my course about documentary cinematography. Well, it also feels very filmic, the, the look and the, the, like I think they even jittered a bit of the, the title to try and get that feeling oh, yeah. I don't, yeah. back there. Um, I'd love to know, so there's a scene in the opening that I really liked and I was really impressed with it. It's when they get to the house uh, and they discover the woman sort of, or the person upside down underneath the, the sink. Yeah. And I'm wondering, the reason it impressed me is because it was kind of, it, I don't know where this idea came from. Uh, maybe it was from one of those sessions, but it's a dark house, so there's no lights on, and they sort of explain that as they enter, but then they use their flashlights, and that becomes sort of like the light source, and yet for a scene that should be, you know, like I've heard people complain that films and shows are too dark now on their TVs, but it worked. Like I could see things, and it was just the right thing. I'm wondering how that idea came about and what some of the, the difficulties were in, in shooting that. Um, the ideas of it 
being dark like that, I'm pretty sure we're just written into the script. I feel like it was something that little Marvin wanted from the beginning. I think the power was supposed to be out right away. And the idea is that they come into this house that's been all the windows and doors have been boarded up for reasons that you learn in the story. Mm -hmm. And um, the power has been cut and it's dark. And that, I think that was all in there. So we knew we were going to, and the flashlights were probably written into it. So we knew that this is what the idea was. And then for me, it's always figuring out how, like you're saying, like what, what that balance is, like, how do we show what we need to show, make it feel like they need these flashlights, but not uh, go so dark that you can't see anything or go so phony bright that why are they using flashlights? <laughs> That's always like, anytime I do a scene like that, in that kind of idea it's always a balance that you got to figure out um and the key for me is really just the flashlights are great because what they do is they they really help they let the actor find the story as she's going through it she's discovering all these elements all these key the mold on the ceiling the clock with the broken hands the uh the shattered glass the cables that lead into the room uh, you know, and then everything that happens in there and as they walk into the kitchen later on. And so she's discovering things. And as she's discovering, she's using the flashlight and that's what's showing her. So I, what I did is I allowed it to be really dark. We had little glows from the window so you could tell that there was, you know, a world outside, mm -hmm. but it didn't penetrate inside of the house. It just kind of glowed the, the curtains that they put up. And I would talk with um, Deborah. The, and all the other actors that had flashlights about where to shine them and how to kind of work with it and get the spot and the beam and you know the the intensity of the light and all of that um, to be the right amount and I would just guide them through it and we would kind of it was it made it really simple because is so much of the story being evolved as she's discovering it so it allowed mm -hmm. us to only see these little key elements but because it's being lit by a flashlight it's bright enough to for exposure wise to not feel like you're squinting to see and you can't understand what it is mm -hmm. but everything around the flashlight beam of light would just fall off yeah and that allowed me i think for what for what it did to me was it allowed it to feel kind of realistic like if you were walking into a place that was so dark you couldn't see and you needed a flashlight mm -hmm. you only really see that beam of light you know where you mm -hmm. hit the light where the light hits the ground or the walls so we photographed it that way and it was a dance between her the camera operator and you know everyone involved with just kind of how to how to land where we needed to land. Now there's another scene, but it's it's in another episode, and it's where um, like basically she chases a guy, and he goes through like through the the area and into the different houses or different mm. apartments. I'm wondering um, because it's a wonder <laughs> like. What was the setup for that? Like, how much practice went into it? Like, how did you guys execute that? Because it's going, it's literally like we're outside, bright sun, and it's like, okay, now we're inside, and it's like he's got, like you said, they've got the windows covered, the mirrors covered, everything's sort of covered, so it's dark inside. So going back and forth, I'm wondering how you tackled that. Yeah, it's a great. That was a, that was one of the more challenging sequences we did, if not the most challenging sequence we did in the whole season because of all of those elements, but um, it was a great, I mean, that was written, in, I don't think it was initially written into the script that was gonna be kind of this one continuous thing, obviously, but we we were scouting and the scene was being broken up in multiple ways because of the location. The location had like, you know, um, like as you know from watching it, she goes in through different apartments and she's chasing mm -hmm. this guy and he's running through apartments, doors that lead into the next apartment, that lead into the next apartment, outside, upstairs, inside, and we ended up talking about the idea of doing this as a wonder just to create this kind of energy and try and keep the pace with her and the freneticness as she is going through all these places and what kind of terror that would bring to her. And so we found a location that would work. And basically it was like this is an apartment building in Atlanta and we're, it was half occupied and we were able to, and one of the buildings were pretty much completely run down uh, with no occupants and, and our production designer went in and we were able to cut holes in the walls and put doors in where we wanted to. So we were able to kind of create this labyrinth of a pathway for her. 
And um, and we would we drew it out on paper. We built 3D models and walked it out with little stick figures and cameras and things like that to really plan it. We would go in and we would build and, and look at the design and walk it with the director and I and just make sure it was working. But it did take a lot of extra planning with the crew. And what we ended up having to do is go in on a Saturday or Sunday and, and pre shoot it basically like did a pre light, but also had our camera operators there with the cameras running around with the actor going through it and just making sure we could get all the beats dialed in because there were so many elements, not just with her and Curtis, the guy that she's chasing, but it's also all the background and all the stunt performers that are involved in that. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to figure and the camera operator, because it's all one. It was actually three shots in total from the time that she enters to the time that she goes into Curtis's house later on, mm -hmm. um, like three minutes later, and there's two stitches. So, um, but the idea, was, it was tricky because of the inside outside going upstairs over banisters and all that. Mm -hmm. So we did do a lot of like iris pulls from wide open to almost completely down. You know, I, I probably didn't have any ND in the camera. And I would just crank it as soon as they go inside or outside. And <clears throat> we had stunts involved where we had to like, you know, get multiple camera operators involved. So at the end of the sequence, she runs upstairs. She goes th through another room and she spots Curtis just jumping over a balcony onto a car and she chases mm -hmm. him. And when she gets out on the balcony, People come, angry neighbors come, and they throw her down the stairs. And so it looks like one take, and the camera's leading her all of a sudden down the stairs. And the way we had to do it is we had Spencer, our camera operator, running with the camera behind her when we're upstairs, running behind her onto the balcony. And then he pivoted with her, kept her on the back, on her back. And this was our stunt performer this time. Mm -hmm. The people threw her down. He starts passing off the camera, and he ran down the stairs, passed off the camera to her other operator who was on a crane that was being driven and he and then so the camera crane started to drive away as the stunt performer started rolling down the stairs towards the camera yeah. and then once we got to the bottom he passed the camera back off to spencer who was now at the bottom waiting and was able to finish the shot and when the shot went up to the ceiling up to the sky that's where that second stitch happened yeah and uh, and then it continued back down when she gets up, and now we have Deborah in there again, and that shot continued until she ran inside. So it was a lot of like huge elements, and it took us many many days of figuring it out uh, as a you know all of us in the office walking it, and then that one specifically big day with the most of the most of the uh, film unit there to make it happen on that set Sunday just to plan it out. And then when we did it on the day of shooting, I mean I think we spent the first like five, six hours, just planning it again, you know, running through it before we started shooting. Well, it's funny because that stair scene was specifically, I was going to ask about because I, I rewatched it a couple times because I was like, how did they get the scent performer in? There's no way they had the actor do the fall. Right. And then like, how did they get down? It was like trying to figure that all out. Yeah. It was just in my head. I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know how like we started inside with Deborah, the actor, and she yeah. on her face leading her into the kitchen. And then the camera pans over and sees Curtis on the balcony. Mm -hmm. At that point, when the camera's on Curtis, Deborah stepped out, our stunt performer stepped in, and she followed our camera until we got onto the balcony. And then when we pan back, that was mm -hmm. the back of our stunt performer. Still the same shot, no cuts. And then it yeah, it continues as I just explained. Yeah. Yeah, my first guess was like, oh, yeah, she ducked out when she had in, they like, swapped her somehow. And then, like, you go down the stairs. I'm like, well, now we see the stairs. So we would see the person ducked out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a tricky one. It was a great effort by our, everyone and our stunt performer. Man, she had to nail that. And that was not a. Yeah. Was how her, many, was how her many steel... that? What's that? How many takes did that one section take? I think when we did it on the day, I think we. I feel like we only did it once when we recorded, like for the real thing. We performed it when that Sunday that we went there, I think she went down it like four or five times or six times or something like that. Yeah. Just kind of felt it out and, and got to know it. And then 
but I'm pretty sure we only did one take of that because you know once we got it we're like we knew it worked and we didn't want to risk her again obviously for yeah. no reason I'm pretty sure it was just the one take you know? that like you were about to say it's like those are metal stairs so I it's yeah that they those are iron stairs they weren't padded there was not like she had a pad on her back under her yeah. wardrobe but they weren't soft stairs they were real yeah. stairs that were just there you know and uh and there's a lot of them. <laughs> well, I would I'd also love to know about um, episode seven. Now, uh, before we started the interview, you said that episode seven was your favorite to shoot. What was it about episode seven that you loved? Uh, seven was kind of a departure. I mean, the storyline continues through, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a departure in, in the look and the feel of it. And it was an episode that little Marvin directed the, who's the creator and showrunner of the show. And it was the first episode of anything that he's directed television wise. And, um, and we took a lot of liberties from and departures from what the look of the show was. And we kind of reinvented this idea. And the thing, the questions that he came up with initially were like, how do we make this feel claustrophobic? How do we make it feel like its own thing a little bit? I want to make sure that it doesn't, you know, he wanted to make sure that it kind of had its own identity. Mm -hmm. And one of the first discussions we were talking about was claustrophobic and these compositions that were just about the face and uh, and not no negative space was, do we go with a uh, uh, four by three, you know, aspect ratio? And that was kind of one of an early discussion that we had that stuck with us, um, which we kept for most of the episode till the end when it goes back to 240. But for the majority, it was uh, it was four three, and um, and the whole process of working with Little Marvin and just talking about it and planning out all these elements was such a creative process. The whole show was a creative show, but this one was just so much more so freeing and so different. Uh, it was such a great experience to do it. It was just like there were no bad ideas. Every idea would, that we liked, we would just. We would gravitate to he would rewrite them into the script when they worked and and that was kind of how we how we proceeded the whole way through um and so like early in the show in the beginning of before go, doing the pilot one of the initial discussions was rain and we were thinking that what was initially written in was that it was raining the whole time this whole few week process time period was a rainy time in la but uh, obviously budget, that was going to be a huge thing doing that. And with all this exterior work in, uh, Atlanta in the middle of the summer was going to be huge. So we got away from that. But when this episode came up, episode seven, where they're pretty much in a house the whole time. And it's this, like, after this traumatic event that happened to her son and they're kind of just locked in and he's going through all this trauma, trying to figure out what's happening to him. She's trying to understand the reality of all this craziness that's been going on we were like, well, this is a time we could bring the rain back and just do a rainy day and keep them like completely trapped in their house and make it feel like that. And when it rains in LA, people don't go out that much. It's, you know, you kind of just stay in. So this was a perfect example or, or a perfect reason to kind of to do that and then helped us create this cooler, bluer look. You know, the rest of the show is very warm. Now we were able to kind of like control the, the environment to feel differently. So now it was just this kind of cold, damp feeling the whole time in this four, three box in their house. And it allowed us to do, you know, to make it feel different to all these elements that I think Lil Marvin was after. And um, yeah, it was just such a creative process the whole time. I, I loved it. Probably one of the smartest things I've ever done for my career. It gave me all the tools that I needed to be able to jump into a, a new career. Getting myself into a mindset, thinking like an editor, and being around people that I can talk to on that level was really invaluable to me. A lot of the things that I learned from that class, I still think about. I loved the classroom. I loved the computer station. We built a sense of community. And it also instills a lot of confidence in you to take that and go out into the world. After I took the class, I felt very prepared to take the next step. I owe Manhattan a workshop. The career that I have right now, things have been going great, and I really have the Manhattan workshop shop to thank for that. It was, the thing I really 
appreciate it. And you kind of talked about the claustrophobia and it kind of feels like because we're in the house the whole time, except for the sort of last chunk. Um, but I'm wondering also, like, when you were approaching the scene, what were some of the things you you undertook to, I guess, ratchet up the, the tension or, um, I guess, make us more scared? Like, I think about certain moments that can sort of put you on edge in the scene. And I'm wondering, you know, what were some of the things you guys sort of explored doing to make it so nerve wracking? I think one of them was um, the close ups. I think we talked a lot about the close ups and what they would be like, rather than just, you know, the regular, uh, a very form formulated TV show would do master medium close ups. We didn't do that for pretty much the whole sh series. But in this episode specifically, we would just do sequences that were just here, you know, and we wanted to shoot it that way. And it was this extreme close up the whole time. And we thought, and that was part of like the four, three aspect ratio to not see all the side space. Mm -hmm. We just wanted everything to be on the face, you know, to all of their emotions to be seen. And that's the only thing you can register and take in as an audience. And by doing that, and then having these moments where something would catch her attention off, off camera, you know, like like the banging in the closet and she's like whipping her head around and then boom, the camera pans quickly and then whips back to her. And now he's, you know, her son's gone, like in that nice sequence there in, in his bedroom, you know, things like that really allowed it to just be heightened, I think. And I think the other thing was the amount of coverage that we did. It was really, it wasn't about, nothing was like, let's just get coverage and figure it out later. It was designed, you know, every shot led into the next shot. We knew how it was going to be cut together this way by how we shot it mm -hmm. and by not doing too much coverage and letting the camera live with the actors at the right time, it created tension. You know, it, it didn't allow it to, to be broken easily. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then again, you know, performances, I mean, the actors were phenomenal and, uh, and little Marvin wrote it that way. He knew exactly what he wanted and what he was doing. And, and everyone, you know, we all just, Everyone on that episode, this was actually the last episode we shot, even though it was episode seven. Um, but everyone just brought their A game and tried to make it the best thing we could. And uh, I think all of that helped. Yeah. Well, and I loved, there's the shot where it sort of spins or pushes in on the family photo and turns upside down. And you have the shadows of the water, like the rain on the windows. Yeah. Uh, very... Um, is it, is it Conrad uh, Bluff or whatever the cinematographer who did that and not that, but rain on yeah, the Conrad, rain. Conrad Hall in the, in Conrad the Hall. blood. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, that shot is amazing to, that you brought that up though, because that shot was such a, a thing, even though it's an insert of a photo on a wall, mm -hmm. it was a big element for us and it was a turning point in the episode and that's why we turned it upside down you know that's why the camera pushes in and flips upside down and then you cut to the inside of her bedroom and the whole camera spinning upside down it's like this big moment of, of the whole thing shifting and that was a set piece that we built just for that shot because we were the where the photo lived on the real set was like in a tight little hallway and there was a wall right behind us we could never do this big push onto us so we built that somewhere else we brought in all these elements we shot it on a, you know, a 50 foot crane that rotated as we pushed in and we carried it with us quite a bit and made it very important. Like, you know, it's, it's not just an insert, it's a shot that's going to live in the show and it's just a turning point. So yeah, that, but that was part of like the whole thing. Everything was so well thought out for that episode that everything had its place. Yeah. And that is a, a great example of that. What, like, because cinematographers now their right hand man is like the the colorist right you you work very closely with them uh so what was your approach for this show with the colorist like how did you work together to get the look i was in there quite a bit throughout the strikes doing the color and mm -hmm. we would just kind of do it the way we would with anything else we knew what the light was in the initial approach and we just kind of worked it from there uh and went scene by scene and sequence by sequence and and little Marvin was in there the whole time. We talked about the lift, the, you know, the shadows and kind of have the contrast and the texture and everything. And we would find it. We just kind of tweaked our levels until we found something that we thought this is the baseline. This is what we can now reapproach to everything and, and, you know, 
went from there. And then episode seven was different. Obviously, we kind of retweaked that on its on its own to be that cool thing, which we shot that way as well. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I have you know one last question that I usually ask, and but we've already done an interview before where I've asked you what your favorite guilty pleasure film is. So yeah. you do a photography as well. So I'm wondering who are some photographers that we should check out? Um I think one of my favorite photographers now and always has been Fan Ho. He's a street photographer um, from the 50s and uh, from Hong Kong. And his photography is like some of the most amazing black and white cinematic looking photography you could ever imagine. And to me, that's how I, I, and like the way he would use shape and light and patterns and silhouettes was is like you know some some of the most inspirational stuff for me i look at it when i do movies all the time i look at his work and just kind of look at how he balances everything and it's uh you know it's quite striking so check out Van ho well thank you so much for letting me interview again yeah thanks for doing it appreciate it and that's it for this week everyone make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or of course on instagram at filmmaker underscore you i'm gordon raquel thanks for watching